Hi, friends. Welcome again to another episode of Beyond the Clouds, Edge to Edge Transformation. And this kind of transformation needs us to get out of silos and see the big picture. Rebecca is one of the people I got to know during our synopsis days when she was a staunch customer advocate and wouldn't let us get away with just, you know, just putting a feature here and bells and whistles there. And she's been a staunch customer advocate in many different you know, different industries since then, much broader and many interesting roles. So Rebecca, tell us about how you became the person we know today. What was well, your that's journey? probably a very, very long story, Shankar. Uh, you know, I, I think, so we met obviously doing EDA and electronic design automation, um, really working to try and figure out how do we enable semiconductor companies to unlock quickly the performance and capabilities they needed which is why customers always matter. Uh, I moved on from there to Intel. At Intel, I eventually ran the cloud business, which was really around enabling our hyperscalers to scale their platforms and performance as quickly as possible uh, with Intel products, whether that was network interface cards or obviously the Xeon processors. Uh, and that was an incredible journey, an incredible ride, an incredible opportunity to learn. Uh, and then I was offered the opportunity to come run basically infrastructure engineering, the hardware systems development platforms uh, for Cloudflare. And Cloudflare is a connectivity cloud. And what do we mean by a connectivity cloud? It may not be something you're familiar with, uh, but fundamentally we sell protective services via a cloud interface. And when I say protective services, you know, that sounds like it could be making sure your credit score is correct. I don't mean that. I mean, your front door to the web, your back door from the web, so your intranet, we ensure that only the people who should be accessing that can access that. So we protect from DDoS, we protect from anything that might come in through the front door, or we ensure that only your employees can access your intranet services correctly. And there's a bunch of different tools and features and things, but that's what I would say sort of Cloudflare does is it connects you to your users, front door, back door, the ones who actually should have access so that you can make the internet a better place. Um, and I love it. I love that we get to build these systems and unlock new user experiences. And I learn every day, <laughs> sometimes what to do, sometimes what not to do, uh, which is you know fundamentally how we learn. So that's how I got here. So now uh, when you think about your career trajectory, you could have comfortably been in graphics, GPUs and all that stuff, or you could have been comfortably in EDA. What made you move from one domain to the other and how has it enhanced or enriched your life and career? You know, for me, I always, I'm a contextual learner. I think a lot of us went through university and had more theoretical learning experiences. I certainly did. Um, and it wasn't until I started working that I really felt like I got my hands on concrete problems and got to solve them. And uh, I loved it. And to your point, I started at Silicon Graphics and I definitely was in, uh, <laughs> before GPUs were a cool thing, we, we were doing work in that domain. Um, but each and every opportunity really for me was an opportunity to learn more about how our customers used our products. So I went from Silicon Graphics to ATI. I went from ATI into Synopsys. I went from Synopsys to Intel. I went from Intel to Cloudflare. And each one was one level up in terms of abstraction uh, so that I could learn more what the underlying systems or silicon should be so that we could build better things to solve the world. So I think it's just generally been, uh, I've optimized for my own curiosity and trying to make sure I understand what I'm trying to accomplish in a way that, you know, I can listen. I hope I listen well, but if you don't listen, or even if you do listen, you never necessarily have the same context as when you put your foot into the shoes of your customer and say, oh, that's tight. Why did we do that? That was a bad idea. Let's go in this direction and that will enable us to accomplish X, Y, or Z for our customers and to move forward in the world. Now that cloud and AI and gen AI is all the rage, sometimes I see companies having being forced to take on these technologies without really knowing what they are getting into. Um, 
I know you have been always a great customer advocate. You've always seen what it's like to be a customer. Um, how do you help them in this process of making sense of the cloud and using it where it's appropriate in the right way? Um, and have you had many opportunities to work with them in these kinds of roles? So, I mean, obviously I work on the infrastructure here at Cloudflare. So I get a little less time to work directly with our customers externally. I work with our internal customers. Uh, but one of the most, I would say, exciting projects and that is certainly focused on generative AI this last year, this this year, where we haven't yet gone to 24, uh, was what we announced at our birthday week back in September, which was basically enabling AI standard models to run anywhere on our edge. And this is under the premise that inference happens far more often in artificial intelligence than training. And you train a model, sometimes you actually use pre-trained models, but afterwards you infer from those models, you use them to predict is this image a cat? Or you use them to generate, if it's generative AI, some image of, I don't know, I, I feel like we use in my family chat GPT to generate silly images all the time for whatever cool story my six-year-old comes up with. And that is really a very regular activity, <laughs> but also stories uh, for, for bedtime. <laughs> like Honestly, uh, during all of COVID, I had to make up so many stories for my kids as we were all kind of shut in together every night. And I was proud of myself for my abilities. Uh, but then this last year happened and now I just asked ChatGPT to make a bedtime story for my kids with a prompt that they like. And it's much more interesting and exciting than anything I could have come up with, um, which makes me a little bit sad. And also bedtime's a lot easier. <laughs> so when I look at some of these options, you know, what we tried to do was say, hey, we're a connectivity cloud. We are within 50 milliseconds of any user. And there may be people who want to train. And, you know, there's tons of companies out there from CoreWeave, Microsoft, obviously with Azure, and everybody else who is offering training on top of their public clouds. But inference happens about a thousand times more often. Right, like look at ChatGPT. It's a six-month cycle to reduce to produce a new version of that particular model. But how many times a day do I use it as an individual user to do some inference, to do some generative activity, whether it's silly cat pictures or bedtime stories? So that inference is something that happens everywhere. Different people want to control that information in different ways. I want a private access to the stories that I tell my kids. Uh, I want to be able to read them and make sure that they adhere to my standards as a parent. And that's something that I can do in my controlled version of a login to that particular model. And we're seeing more and more of that in the ecosystem. Whether you look at somebody like Hugging Face, who's giving different models pre-trained to be able to run them, um, or you know, everything, everything, SageMaker, everything that is out there in the ecosystem for developers, that is really, they're not necessarily training every model. They're using trained models for interesting use cases so that you can interact with your health record and not have to search through pages and pages and pages of, you know, thousands of pages of your health record just to figure out what was the actual prescription that you took back in 2009, post whatever happened, right? Um, people want that kind of interactive, quick interface, but with their own private data. And so Cloudflare doubled down on that concept. We introduced something that we call Workers AI, which is a developer interface on top of standard pre-trained models that you can interact with, whether it's things like Stable Diffusion or Hugging Face, but also just any Llama CPP uh, variant, usually Llama 7 billion variant is the one that we support kind of out of the box for you to do, you know, and generative AI chat bot for your website quickly and bring it up quickly and have it run in different domains, fully regionalized. Because Cloudflare, we operate in 300 different, you know, 300 plus uh, different cities in over a hundred countries. And so if you want to have your data stay in Europe and never leave the Schengen zone, you can do that. You just turn a switch. And that is absolutely what's gonna happen. 
Wow, exciting. So <laughs> I hope you write a book called Chat GPT or Gen AI for good parenting. Because <laughs> creating stories. so different from leaving the kids in front of uh, television or videos, you know, that's what used to happen 20 years ago. So do you really see that happening? Um, people using these tools uh, to create unique experiences, a more engaged parenting, more engaged life with all these tools? I think we're starting to see it. I think we're just at the beginning of it. Um... I mean, obviously I had two specific pain points there. Uh, one, a very, very creative six-year-old who comes up with all sorts of stories and wanting him to sort of lean into that by generating pictures for them. Uh, and one around me not wanting to generate all these different stories. Uh, but one of the things I find so fascinating, uh, we were, my kids and I were having a discussion, to your point, uh, around the four fundamental forces of physics. Well, I can find a YouTube video on that. And I can share it with them. It's probably by a very stuffy old professor telling them, you know, every way in which they should care about the strong and weak force. But isn't it more interesting to ask a question and to get a response? And I think there's a lot of ways in which these models will allow you to just interlocute the interlo yeah, the interlocution. There we go. There's the word uh, with an interface in an interesting fashion. And, you know, I, I, again, I can only kind of think how my brain works, but most people I know prefer to learn in context and prefer to have, and we've seen actually great research that shows that a tutor is the best methodology for learning. It kind of unfortunately doesn't scale though, right? We can't have a one-to-one -one ratio in every classroom and every school, but you can have a chat GPT or some, you know, LLM based backend model that allows somebody to interact and ask questions and double down. You can feed chat GPT a picture of a graph and say, explain to me what's going on here. Help me understand what does this mean? What does that mean? Why is it in logarithmic scale? And that can help people understand decibels and that can help people in an, in a context that standard search never did. Right? Like if you knew what to search for next, you could go down the primrose path of wiki surfing through Wikipedia to learn. And lots of us did, and lots of us love that. And we learned, you know, research by going to a library and looking things up in card catalogs. Like these things existed for lots of us before the internet became so fascinating in terms of, of Google's capabilities. But it is no less like a step function in the human efficiency of cataloging knowledge to go to an interactive response that is optimized for the individual who's querying the data. And I think that's, um, I don't know if that makes you a better parent or if that just helps you, you know, make sure your kids are met where they are. But I, I would fundamentally believe that that is an interesting area of education that we are going to move towards, you know, not a standardized test, but tests that interact with individuals to really understand the strengths and weaknesses of their knowledge base and then help them solve them. A great teacher does this, but scaling that to 24 students is, is very difficult to do. How do we make sure everybody ends up in a better place? Well, it's it's increased customization, but doing that in a scalable fashion. Very true, very true. And um, many of us were used to uh, classes with a thousand students and felt completely diminished or uh, uh, disempowered. So this is quite a breath of fresh air to have AI co-pilots. Uh, at the same time, there are these little challenges like uh, some of Accuracy. these hallucinate and give <laughs> wrong answers. But I guess yeah. it's part of the learning process, isn't it? Um, that there are times when it doesn't exactly give what is accurate, but um, maybe it's a part of how we learn, isn't it? Well, I think, so the better, if a user has the opportunity to use their critical thinking to tag the data and say, that doesn't seem accurate, you know, that is another way in which I think we can reduce this, but it is a real problem. Like we do not definitively want people to learn the wrong data. And generative AI does have a very definitive response, uh, but there are techniques you can use to train and tag data to, you know, pre, um, 
or to train a more limited model. You know, there's a lot of research that shows sort of child models trained off the mother model with a more specific use case. And I think in the space of education, we'll want to do that, right? It, it, it's a good safety practice um, to try and make sure the data sets that they're interacting with are not necessary topics that we have want our kids to go, you know, down and staying closer to maybe the topics that we would like to ensure are well vetted sources. So, you know, it's not going to be maybe the way that I interact with it using chat GBT more generically. I think you'll see some great education startups that are focused on limiting the corpus to accurate data that then where they're focused on the user interface so that children can have a more interactive tutoring style approach. It will probably take ed tech to the next level with high interactivity and uh, customizability. Yeah. It That's has to, amazing. our kids need us. I mean, when you think about how much information there is out there to learn, uh, I hope so. I, I truly hope so. Um, and what about the challenge of bias? I mean, you know, um, even when my daughter, she excelled in mathematics. And so the teachers are like, oh, but boys do better than girls. That, so we have human biases and they're reflecting in systems that are also carrying forward these human biases and, uh, you know, all kinds of distortions of information. Um, I don't know if it's easy to, easy to solve these problems because they're continuing what we do in real life, isn't it? Of course, of course. Um, again, there's a lot of things we can do to train on specific corpuses of data and to try and be more consistent or more diverse or more. And there's so many people out there much more knowledgeable about me than about this than me, uh, looking at the space of ethical AI and how we control and manage some of these factors like bias. Um, so, you know, best to sort of refer to what they're doing in the domain of foundational models and then sort of pre-trained or um, specifically trained models in subsets of information so that we have a little more consistency, whether for accuracy reasons or to you know ensure that we're not having bias. But I think you hit the nail on the head too, which um, I try not to fear things that are unknown. <laughs> They're unknown because we need to learn more. That's the goal. Um, we shouldn't stop what is arguably a step function in human augmented intelligence because we don't have perfect control and understanding of bias or potential for hallucination. We need to figure out how to control, to manage, to tag information, to say this seems inaccurate, to work with experts, to ensure that these systems are getting better and work for the functions we need them to work for rather than say, oh, this AI stuff is just, that's too much. You know, I, I don't, um, I would love to see one teacher be able to oversee a classroom using these kinds of tools and yes, catching if the diameter of the earth was given inaccurately. Uh, that's, that's what she is the expert there to do versus sort of, you know, and, and I will just say one more thing, which is, you know, we've constantly find in our textbooks inaccuracies. Humans, we keep learning. Honestly, friend, I just read a book last weekend and I was shocked and awed that there is no such taxonomic thing as fish. These don't exist like vertebrates and invertebrates. It's a very convenient classification, but fish don't exist in the taxonomic record. Mind blown. Every day I learn something new and, you know, I was taught that fish are a thing, not just a convenient term for everything from mammals to, you know, vertebrates to invertebrates that happen to be wrapped in scales. Uh, <laughs> so we all, we all keep learning and we have to keep doing that. And we have to rely on educational, you know, organizations, research to keep us on the straight and narrow, but use this as a new opportunity to delve deeper, to introspect, to help humans deal with the amount of information that is out there so that we can become better. You've made a really good point that inferencing is used far more than, uh, than uh, training. And also 
that we need more and more personalized private inferencing, which means I guess we have to go closer to the edge or to internets, right? Is that where you see the whole development going towards um, specialized applications at the edge? So certainly Cloudflare's big bet is in that domain, right? Um, I think from a, a chip design development point of view, I can say, you know, there's there's two phases of running a model for inference. There's the time to first token at the load of the model, and then there's subsequent tokens that are rendered out of that model. Um, latency is important in both, but different in terms of where the bottlenecks might be. Time to first token, you have to load and put all the weights into the silicon. This is something where we're going to see, you know, T flops actually matter. And that will be scaled by memory bandwidth, by IO2, the accelerator. Um, so, you know, a, a bigger, beefier interface and interconnect will probably do that model load fastest. Subsequent tokens, once the model's been loaded, will be a combination of you know the size of the query and the location and the, the latency to the eyeball, to the end user. And certainly, you know, if we've preloaded our models, having them geo-distributed everywhere gives us very low latency characteristics. And that's how Cloudflare has built our network. We're, we're 50 milliseconds to any user approximately. So that's our goal always. <laughs> so certainly we see that, but I do see models that take more than 80 milliseconds to load that first token. So I feel I have to, you know, honestly say there's those two phases and maybe we did it wrong. I'm excited to see how we learn uh, as our users, you know, hammer on this and then evolve. Um, but yes, I think latency is always the most important factor and it just depends on which phase and if it's preloaded or not as a model into the device how we'll get to lowest latency characteristics for end users. So Rebecca, you've worked on in a variety of roles and in a variety of domains. Where do you think you learned the most and was the most exciting period of your career? Oh my golly gee, I don't know the answer to that, Shankar. Uh, so I, oh, oh. Uh, every single one, I would say that one, that one, uh, because there were different, there were different lessons. You know, obviously, um, I have a little bit of temporal bias. So my current role, <laughs> I am in the context of the user space that I had sort of built for the previous seven years. Uh, and so I feel like I learn so much. Maybe the right way of saying this is the first six to 12 months of a job, I learn the most. Because all the assumptions that you bring in <laughs> you have to learn a whole new culture, a whole new company, a whole new set of um, constraints, right? It's a new constraint model. So you're applying your brain in a new context, and that's going to lead to this kind of rapid growth. Um, it's interesting because I think humans, we tend to like to stay in something where we know what we're doing. And then of course you get asymptotic, right? You'll, you'll slow down in your learning curve and you'll make more assumptions, I find. Uh, and it's only when you kind of mess with yourself and move yourself into a new domain again. Uh, and even when I stayed at the same company, I tended to get a new job every two, two to three years uh, because you get off that rapid learning curve. And you know, for me, it's the people I work with, their their culture, their, you know, everything about the individuals, and it's the learning. That's that's why I chose engineering. That's why I've stayed in technical roles because it's just hard to imagine any better way of staying up to date on what's happening in the world. I mean, I could read the newspaper every single day and have not nearly the context of doing my job. That is awesome. Like that is awesome. Uh, every day, just because of what I work on, who I work with, how we serve others, I get to learn. Um, so it's the best job ever. Every single time I talk with, you know, women and underrepresented minorities in colleges and younger, I, I always talk about that. I'm like, do you like to learn? If you like to learn, 
Let me tell you about this thing called engineering, where you're going to get paid to learn every day of your life. Um, it is the most incredible opportunity, but you have to want it and you have to like it and you have to like learning versus always being super comfortable and knowing you know everything, which, you know, isn't for everyone. Very true. And uh, uh, engineering careers these days give us the opportunity to be out of the comfort zone every few months, right? <laughs> it seems uh, like that. It only gets faster. <laughs> it only gets faster. That's true. Another thing which you um, directly or indirectly touched upon, it's not just learning stuff. It's not just learning about new ideas and processes. It's also learning about people and what oneself. Can you get into that a little bit? The role of um, soft skills or emotional intelligence, if you will, how that has been a part of your own journey and how that's important no matter what we do? It's a great question. Um, so before, long before I became a manager, I was doing work in product and with customers. And, you know, that's where having big ears and a little mouth really helps. I talk a lot, Shankar, you know this, uh, but you cannot learn if you're too busy talking. So the first skill set I really had to develop in those domains was to stop pitching and to just hear what their problems are. I had a great boss who was who took me through a process of what are discovery questions. Um, and then I think I, I had the advantage of being a theater nerd growing up. And so reading an audience and understanding, you know, are they with me or are they not? You know, I had that background. Um, also wasn't afraid of, of public speaking, which is very helpful. Again, not something I learned in college, it had nothing to do with college. College was about how fast could I assimilate data and then show that I could use it to solve problems as quickly as possible. Uh, but once you get into the real world as an engineer, it's about project collaboration. You're very rarely the only person who's working on something. So working with the rest of the group to understand their components, your components, what the inputs and the outputs have to be. Uh, you know, my first roles were in verification. And so making sure the Silicon developers, like what they actually wrote in their specification, interpreting the English into mathematical algorithms, testing those, making sure they were correct. And then if not, filing bug reports and helping people understand how to fix it. Uh, it's a ton of writing. It's a ton of reading. It's a ton of comprehension, you know, in terms of reading specifications and making sure they're correct. I think these are all domains where generative AI, by the way, will help because it will help people, you know, figure out what the spec is trying to say and get it right and test faster based on, you know, what was intended behavior and what was actually done in the code, which is often very different. Uh, and I think increasingly you see Copilot and other tools like that. I heard you mention earlier that will help people not even need separate introspection. The, the tool itself will be the verification engineer to the design intent. Um, so literally my first five years of my career, you, you have an AI assistant who can do all of that for you, which is phenomenal. Now we can go do more interesting things, which is inevitably what I did five years in. So soft skills, learning those young, I, I again, Loved doing theater as a kid, found a lot of joy and, and partnership and friendship uh, in those communities. And those skills were the things I didn't learn in college that helped me in the early parts of my career move towards, you know, project management, like all aspects of product, marketing. Uh, I never really did marketing, but I did marketing in the sense of understanding what our customers needed and then trying to make sure we did it in our products. And, you know, then moving forward, becoming a manager, there's no, there's no more important skills than caring for your people and trying to unlock their potential in the context of something that's useful to the company. That's true. And it's, it's interesting how our careers change who we are. Do you think you're the same Rebecca who joined the industry and where, where you are today? In what ways has your career in engineering, which we think of as a nerdy, geeky thing, has made you a better person today? Oh, it's such a good question. So I think when I came out of college, I didn't have a lot of confidence uh, as an engineer. 
you know, you learn so much, you're, you're drinking from a fire hose, uh, and it's incredibly intense. And I think that's true no matter where you study engineering, uh, it's an incredibly intense experience and probably a little bit regressive, uh, when I started out in the field, I didn't look like everybody else. I didn't look anything like everybody else. And that was very disconcerting to me. And I spent a lot of the first years of my career feeling a little out of place and worrying and carrying. Um, fear isn't quite the right term. I didn't feel like I was physically under threat or anything like that, but just uh, not feeling like I was part of something. And because of that, not focusing on the learning, not focusing on much other than just like, do what I need to do, don't look bad. You know, very much the duck analogy of life where try and make sure everything is calm and everyone thinks everything's right. And underneath the water, you're like, oh, that was most of the beginning of my career uh, and most of my collegiate experience. I think it took probably two or three years in the industry having accomplished something with a team of people that I built trust with to have faith in myself and my abilities to start to acknowledge that I don't look like everyone else and probably don't think like everybody else. And that's an asset and not a liability. Um, and then throughout careers, uh, I always, I feel like my career was very much like a Mazda engine. You know, there's a certain amount of spin-up latency in a Mazda, but then it's, there's a significantly more, uh, you know, efficacy in terms of throughput once it gets going. And that's what I found. I, I tried a lot of different things. I learned a lot. I failed a lot. Uh, and then I landed in a great company with great people who were focused on learning I remembered why I chose this in the first place and then just doubled down. And, and that was actually synopsis. It was really, it took, you know, my first job was great, but it took a while to find both a healthy company that had a wide swath of things to work on. I mean, I still remember people coming into my office and saying, Hey, Rebecca, we're working on a quantum thing. You want to, you want to learn more? I'm like, heck yes, I want to learn more. I mean, it was just an incredible place to learn and to keep learning. And Intel had that same culture where just so many fellows who invented USB, who invented PCI Express, who invented like, keep going, just keep going, uh, that were just down the hall, who you could just ask. And, and not only could they tell you anything and everything about sort of the efficacy of ECC design in PCI Gen 4 or 5, but they could also tell you, you know, the whole history of how people sat down together and came to those conclusions and why. Um, so I really, it, it started, it was hard. It was really hard. And then I think as I gained confidence in myself, and acceptance for the fact that I would do it my way, not somebody else's. Then I just focused on people and learning and things kept getting better and better. That's wonderful to hear. And uh, Rebecca, since the time you joined the industry, uh, there has been increase in diversity in terms of who joins the industry. And hopefully it's also increasing in management. Yet the number of women for example, in senior management is still very small. Um, and I know you said you've been uh, been to schools where you talk to young women. Uh, do you think it's changing? And in, if so, what will it take to have more equity in the workplace for women in particular? Unfortunately, the numbers are very consistent. Um, so it was something like 19% of women were graduating with degrees in electrical engineering when I graduated and 20 some odd uh, percent of women, uh, percent of computer science graduates were women. And it's still in the twenties. Um, it's actually, I think went through a dip with electrical engineering, we might be back up, but you know, the numbers are pretty stuck. Uh, and in, you know, my career space, I've seen, um, Unfortunately, you know, when COVID hit, a lot more women seemed to be the ones who took a step back and focused on their families um, without childcare and schools being open. And, and I think a lot of women took a hit in their careers to support that. So 
unfortunately, I don't see enough positive trend in the right direction uh, in terms of you know more more diversity um, in women staying in the industry as long or staying in technical careers. I see them going into tech. I see them in cloud. You know, it's not like, I mean, it's definitely different. And I still remember the first day I walked onto Intel's campus in 2015 and seeing women <laughs> all around me and being like, oh my gosh, you know, there was a point at Intel where my boss and my boss's boss were all women. And it had never happened before in my career. Um, so, you know, I, I say it doesn't feel like it's moving fast enough. It's not moving enough. But I have had pretty incredible experiences where, you know, I'm on a conference call and instead of being the only woman, it's all women. Like this has happened in my life. But I will never forget the time that I was not only the only woman in the room, which happens still all the time, uh, but literally times where there were more Davids in the room than there were women, you know, uh, and that's just kind of the nature of this industry, unfortunately. You know, what, what do we do to change it is where I spend as much time as possible. And I really believe it's in building our pipelines. I think once we get women excited about this and break down kind of the barriers of it, uh, it's an amazing career. It's an amazing career. Um, then the next place we lose them is in the two to three years in the careers. You know, they they enter in, they have an engineering degree, but then they go towards product or marketing or something else that's related, sales, you know, and not a bad thing. They're still in tech. I'm still, I'm still rooting for them, but I would love for them to feel welcome in staying in technical careers. And I think this is where, you know, domains, um, the clarity around just setting objectives, measuring what success looks like, great management helps us retain great women. And I say that because I think a lot of us in the industry um, set up very nebulous goals, you know, make AI better. <laughs> it's a nebulous goal. That's very hard to do versus having more concrete objectives. And then we create situations where individuals have to advocate very hard for themselves. And unfortunately, back to the conversation about bias, women advocating hard for themselves is more negatively judged than men advocating hard for themselves. And there's a great, there's a great set of research. A lot of it is summarized in, in Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, talking about negative bias towards gender for self-advocacy. And it's just, it, it's a reinforcing issue. Why do you not see as many women in senior management? Why do you not see as many women in senior positions in engineering? Well, if we're going to be penalized for self-promotion and the companies don't invest in having clear guidelines for success and clear paths towards advocating for others and proving the meritocracy, then of course your women are never going to succeed. So I think sometimes this more arbitrary approach towards success can put women in a bit of a catch-22. And so the best companies I've seen, and Intel is great at this, use something like objectives and key results, OKRs, uh, or you know goals and objectives, or something that is a structured methodology for saying, this is what we said we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, and measuring that. And that's where I've seen women just take off in their careers. Um, Intel was phenomenal at this, and I, I can only advocate for those kinds of structured approaches because they create a common playing field for everyone so that we can be our best selves. Yes, Intel was definitely an amazing company and I'm glad I worked twice, once during the Pentium days and then second time during the Intel Foundry Services days. Uh, which brings me to the point that you have accomplished a lot already, Rebecca, but I still see you going gung-ho, getting <laughs> up early in the morning and, you know, it's working till late. What is it that keeps you getting up early in the morning? What excites you the most about mm -hmm. your career and about the world at large today? I know kids are a part of it too. Uh, yeah, but I mean, probably my kids would... Uh, I would sit around and read books with him all day. <laughs> that was their choice and mine, probably. Uh, no, you know, I think it is it is learning and it is, the world is just such a fascinating place. 
Um, you know, I still remember my dad waking me up early in the morning to poetry. Like he would literally have read something and think it was so beautiful that he would come in to wake, wake me up to read me Thoreau or whatever it was, E.E. E. Cummings that got him up that morning. And I remember my mom sitting on the side being like, let her sleep. <laughs> she needs our sleep, <laughs> you know, which was also true. But those are some of the most powerful, wonderful experiences of my life were being woken up because my father was so excited about something that he needed to share it. And, you know, I tend to surround myself with those people. You know, my husband is one of those people. My, my bestest friends are those people that are just so excited to learn something new, whether it's a new book, whether it's ways to leverage chat GPT to augment our parenting skills. Um, I, I managed to surround myself with lifelong learners. You are who you choose to be with. And I do fundamentally believe, you know, I, I, if you are optimizing for learning in life, you know, surround yourself with incredible people. You're going to keep learning. Do something that pushes you to keep learning. I, I get up early because I have discipline, but I keep going because it's interesting, right? Like it's hard for me to shut it off. I, I don't think it's because I, I mean, I love my children. I love my spouse. I want to spend time with everybody, but I also love what I do. And I love it because I keep learning. In fact, I've learned so much in the process of interviewing people uh, because I thought I knew it all when I started writing the book. <laughs> and my co-author Ed Sperling said, no, no, go talk to people. And I was like, oh my God. I should keep interviewing the rest of my life so I can learn from people. So Aww. thank you. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. And to everybody listening out there, yes, that's the reason I talk to people because I learn, selfishly speaking, I learn a lot when I'm talking to you. And none of us really has the full big picture. Not even Sam Altman, right? We're all learning with each other. So please come forward. I want to hear your stories. Rebecca, I hope you continue teaching your kids all about the forces and the weak interactive forces and all that at the age of six. That's amazing. I thought I was doing great things teaching Newton's laws on the ski slopes, but you've taken it to the next level. That's amazing. So thanks again. And uh, may you continue to smile and bring this joy of learning and the passion uh, to the next generation and to everybody around you. Thank you, Shankar. It's always so fun to hang out.